Thank you so much, Janice. It's wonderful to see you and thank you, Breakfast Clubbers. I'm so excited to be here. I'm gonna share my screen and I just want someone to verify, give me a thumbs up. Are we good on that? Okay, perfect. Um, grateful for that. So we're gonna go through a little bit fast, a little bit of a speed tour here of the areas of Antarctica that I had a chance to venture to earlier this year. I was in the, um, this was a, a 12 day uh, adventure. And I'm also gonna note that you may see a little footnote on some photographs. Not all of these photographs are mine, um, but I've noted those that are not uh, because there were, there was just open sharing. It was amazing that people would just share these amazing photographs that they had taken while we were traveling. So let's um, dig in and please put your questions in chat. We'll have plenty of time to go through questions um, at the end. And so just, I think most of you know about Antarctica, but I just wanted to include a couple of quick things. For me, this trip was decades in the making. I had actually originally wanted to go to Antarctica in the early 2000s. At the time, I was race walking half marathons and full marathons. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to do that on another continent like Antarctica? And there are races, there are marathons and half marathons they run on the continent. Although having now been there, I, that was a crazy, crazy idea. Um, but this particular trip was three years in the making. It had been scheduled for early 2020. You know what happened then. And then last year, we were 10 days away from departure when they postponed the trip again. So you can bet I was really excited to finally get to Antarctica. The reason I included this map is I want to just have you notice where Antarctica is, which most of you would know, right? It's at the bottom of the earth. But one thing I want to just ask you to do is in the future, when you see maps like this, check to see if Antarctica is on it, because sometimes it's not, it just gets left off. It's the forgotten continent. And just a few quick facts about Antarctica. It represents 20% of the um, Southern hemisphere. It's the fifth largest continent in terms of total area. And there are no permanent residents or native human inhabitants. No countries own, this is a politically neutral place. And that is a result of a treaty that was established in 1959 that establishes the protocol for research and use of the continent, including which limits the number of visitors that can actually be on the continent at any given moment. And some of you may know the history in terms of the, the big race, which was to the South Pole um, and the two explorers, British explorer, Captain Robert Falcon Scott and Norwegian explorer, Roland Amundsen, who both set out in 1911 to get to, you know, be the first people to reach the South Pole. Does anybody know? You know, and put in the um, in the chat who was the winner on this uh, cont uh, this contest, and I will also put in the chat a link for you um, for some more information on that if you're interested in the history. It's fascinating. One of the more fascinating experiences, I think, in terms of all of this, was Irish explorer Ernest Shackleton, who led the British Imperial Trans Trans Antarctic Expedition in 1914 and 1917. He wasn't the first, obviously. He's actually an interesting um, explorer because he actually never achieved any of the goals he set out to achieve. Um, but at any rate, I would encourage you to read the book uh, Endurance, which is the harrowing story of him and his crew. So I'm gonna take you through from where we uh, ventured forth to Antarctica, which, because we were leaving from Tierra del Fuego in the southern tip of uh, Argentina, we crossed the Drake Passage. And for the most part, most travelers um, who are traveling to Antarctica um, travel across the Drake Passage, unless, of course, you're arriving from New Zealand or some other um, direction. But for most of us, this is how you get to the Drake Passage. This is the ship that we were traveling on. It was a fairly small ship. It had, was from Ocean Wide Expeditions in the Netherlands, and it only had 170 passengers, 57 crew, 13 guides. Took that off that information off their website. We actually had, I think, closer to 70 crew and 
closer to 30 expedition guides up and the one doctor, which fortunately, I, except for the fact that his infirmary was across the hall from my room, I didn't get to meet him, um, which is a good thing. So it was a small ship. And the idea of these small ships is they can get into the harbors and bays where we were going to be accessing the continent. So um, just to show you a little bit about how we got there. intentionally fuzzy video because that's how you feel. Twelve to fifteen foot swells. I want you to notice the horizon line. We're on the fifth level, fifth deck of the ship in the dining room. So getting there was a big part of the adventure because traveling across the Drake Passage, it's where the Atlantic, Pacific, and Southern Oceans meet. These are the ghosts of the Drake Passage. And when we had time on that week, it's three day crossing from uh, Tierra del Fuego in Argentina to um, get toward, towards the peninsula on the continent. So we had lots of time on our hands. And one of the things, of course, I was particularly interested in is, all right, what's this look like from the control room? This is the the uh, the bridge on the on the deck um, at the top level of the ship. They're on the seventh level, I believe. And we were generally invited to um, explore the bridge. And on occasion, it was um, closed to passengers when there was severe weather and the crew there needed to really be paying attention. But on a nice day like this, we could freely roam. We had a lot of activities actually to keep us busy over these three days. Uh, on the left here, you see our uh, expedition chief. This is Pippa and she was an amazing, amazing leader. And during the times, this, this area, this is the lounge area that fits most of the passengers. You see a few people standing, but this is where we would hang out for some of our briefings. We had essential briefings, required briefings. They were mandatory for participation in these activities. And I'm gonna talk about some of these activities of being on Zodiacs for our um, exploring, mountaineering, camping, kayaking, and photography and filming. And we also had, a, like we couldn't keep count of all of the educational sessions we had. So this was the expedition crew was made up of people with amazing, amazing talents, um, knowledge, and experience. We had a glaciologist. We had people who've done uh, lived on the continent and done research. Uh, just amazing um, experience that they brought to uh, this this um, this trip. And so these are just some of the kinds of topics that uh, we were um, able to experience. I'm going to talk first about our excursions, because this was how we spent most of our time once we got in and around the continent. So we were three days passage to the continent, and then six days in and around the continent. And this was where all of the fun really was. So the first I'm going to talk about is our landings. And landings was when we would leave the ship on the Zodiac. We had 15 Zodiacs to accommodate the passengers and uh, expedition crew. And we, prior to getting on a Zodiac, however, we had to go through rigorous um, review of our gear. This is my fellow traveler, Becca, and she's working with one of the exp expedition guides to remove all of the dust, knits, whatever you call them, from her Velcro on her jacket. We had to vacuum our pockets. You know how guck collects in your pockets and in the Velcro? We had to clear those all out because we could not bring anything onto the continent that could potentially endanger the, the life, um, the animals and life on them. And then once we got onto the continent, any place that we landed, we could not put anything down on the snow. 
you'll see this green tarp and this big orange bag. The tarp was for us to put our backpacks if we wanted to take it off or just put it down while we were there. And the big bag was where we took our PFDs off, our personal flotation devices that we wore on the Zodiacs. So we couldn't put anything down on the snow. And when we got back on the ship, we had to take our boots through this little wash and make sure we weren't bringing back onto the ship anything that we might have picked up on our boots while we were there. So while we were preparing to go out, our expedition crew went out and would lay a trail for us as to where we could we were allowed to be able to uh, go out onto the continent. So this is one of our expedition guides setting the day's trail. And once we were on the continent, we had to watch out for rush hour traffic. So the penguins create what are known as penguin highways. And this is an example of a penguin highway. So I had to stop and wait until this penguin crossed on the highway. This is shot, by the way, with my iPhone in a plastic case. I could not move forward and cross the path. So we had many mornings of just hanging out with the penguins. Here you'll see this, this was on one of the rocks. I, part of why I like to use these photos is so you can see the scale, is look at the size of these um, mountains that are behind us. And notice that each of these penguins has a chick in, in, its, um, in front of it. So this is the end, you know, it's the end of the summer in that part of the world. So we were there in February, um, in early March. So it's the end of summer. And the, you can see the timing on the sizes of some of these chicks. This was perhaps the smallest chick that we saw, which we worried a little bit about being that small. Most of them were half the size or better of the parent. And this one was quite small, which we worried about since it was heading into um, the winter. And we also had the opportunity to observe penguin behavior. And nesting is one of the behaviors we had the opportunity. This is a chin strap, chin strap penguin. You can see based on their face characteristics. They pick up rocks to make their nests. But don't get too close to my chick. Ooh. And we saw other uh, critters besides the penguins. So these are blue-eyed cormorants. Um, and again, just amazing. Uh, we did not see a lot of birds, uh, but these were ones that we did see quite frequently. And then we also had the opportunity to see other animals up close. In this case, um, this is a Weddell seal. There are people who reside on the continent, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, however, the there are several countries that have um, encampments. Now, can you imagine spending an overnight here? This looks more like a, a shed than anything else. Um, but there are a few places, and you can see someone behind the flagpole here. We did wave to these folks as we went by. This is more like an encampment. This is an Argentinian uh, group and people would stay here for you know three to six months, perhaps at a time. It's the end of the summer. So they're probably finishing out their season. And there were other things that people did when we were on land. Yeah! Mike was the first one to make the polar plunge. I passed on this one. Mountaineering was the second activity that um, we were able to experience, which uh, we did a lot of landings, by the way. And when we weren't doing landings, we were doing some of these other kinds of things. So mountaineering was one of these. 
and you can see the um, this just the scale of the mountains behind us. We did experience while we were walking up here on these mountains behind us, there was an avalanche. So we had the opportunity to hear and see the snow just um, diving off of um, this mountain. And uh, this is from um, this is me in the orange jacket making my way up. Notice that we are belayed. We're um, roped together because we are on a glacier. And because of the possibility of crevices, all of us had to be roped together. So there were eight people with uh, a guide. And we usually you know, went out in groups of there were probably four or five guides um, that were working um, with us together. But we we're tied together at eight at a time. And just um, some, some, again, fabulous photography from an unidentified fellow um, traveler who uh, captured just a, a stunning moment um, to really give you the sense of what this is. And again, scale, you can see the scale on this in terms of the groups that are working their way up this glacier. And there were other activities that you could do in terms of the mountaineering. These are some folks who were doing some ice climbing. It wasn't in my skill set, uh, but it was just really fun to see this small group of people getting out there to be able to, to do some climbing. Kayaking was one of the things I had most looked forward to since I had previously kayaked in the fjords of Norway, north of the Arctic Circle. I was really excited about kayaking uh, near the uh, the peninsula. And this is us when we got out. It was a very windy, very cold day. The sun was shining, but we did, this is one of our colder days. And of course, just our luck that that was the day we were going to be on the water. So this is near Port Lockroy where we had a chance to paddle. And you can see that there was some pretty amazing scenery on these kayaking expeditions. So we had a lot of fun being able to be out there. But you'd notice, of course, we're not going to get too close to any of these icebergs. I'll explain that in a moment. One of the other things I really looked forward to was camping. So this is the view as we're heading out to meet these folks. This is where we're going to be camping. Notice the glaciers in the background and the scale of this is pretty spectacular. The friend that I travel with, she and I have a rule. We don't count a country or a continent unless we sleep on it. So we had to sleep on it. And here's Becca. We're ready to head out for the evening. It's about nine o'clock at night and we're provided with this kit. You can see this big roll. It has a bivouac sack, a sleeping bag and two sleeping pads. Once we get out there, we were given instructions by our guide as to what we needed to do, which was to dig what we called our grave. And we had to dig a hole in which we were going to put our sleeping bags and our bivouac sack. Um, this is actually a Bay Area person. Uh, this is um, San, uh, San Juan. He's an anesthesiologist uh, in the Bay Area, and he was doing a great job. So he was our role model on how to dig this little grave that we were going to be sleeping in. And then this is what it looked like in our sleeping place. Probably about 40 people, probably 9, 30, 10 o'clock by now. Still light out. And here's Becca getting started with enough with the photography. Get over here and start digging. And you can see our ship in the background. And this is what it looked like as I'm about to climb in to sleep for the night. That nice warm ship way off in the background. Um, I've removed my outerwear coat, my gloves, and I'm about to take off my boots and climb in for my, um, my good night's sleep on the continent. Cruising was another activity we did a lot of. So when we weren't landing or doing one of these other planned activities, we were cruising. So again, we've got a Zodiac. It's got about 10 people plus the, the expedition guide in. Um, so this is a little more up close. You can see in terms of scale with our ship in the background. So there's 10 of us on the ship and we were just hanging out, seeing what we might see such as these juvenile fur seals.
I could have sat there all afternoon watching this. Just having fun. And again, this is shot on my iPhone that's in a plastic case. So hence the quality of the video. And there were many other critters that we saw. This is, um, those were fur seals. This is a Weddell seal. There were other critters, not my photo. This is a photo from um, the same person you saw who was digging um, for the camp is Sen Yuan. Amazing, beautiful photographs of a whale. And we had lots of opportunity to just sit and watch. Um, you hear we get a fluke photo from um, watching this whale diving. And one of the other things we had the opportunity to do was not just to see the penguins on land, but also to see them at sea. Here they're porpoising, which is what they do when they're swimming. Again, shot with my iPhone, so the quality is not all the great. But when you get another Bay Area person, Robert Johnson, Bob Johnson, um, who captured this perfectly in terms of watching what happens when the penguins are porpoising. And then there's other critters who might be hanging out. Here we have another seal. Sorry, I have the best view at the moment. I'm not doing it on purpose. Still there. Kind of close to that propeller, it feels. So I would not have wanted to be on that Zodiac wondering what the conversation was like between the guide and Pippa saying, they're biting, they're biting, what do I do? And Pippa's response, don't stop. And this is the view. I want you to note a couple of things about this view. In particular is how flat the water is. So a windless day. Um, we had mornings like this where we might actually step out on deck without a coat on and how um, how flat and quiet it is. Except for the noise of the ice against the hull of the ship, of the icebergs. Serenely quiet. Speaking of icebergs, if you've seen one iceberg, you've seen one iceberg. Icebergs are just fascinating and no two are alike. They're just, the color is just, I can't describe. It's, it's just indescribable. And the shapes that you see are also pretty amazing. This particular arch that was formed um, as we were uh, cruising around this, we could hear it starting to calve. And as we were, we backed off a little bit, obviously, as it was calving, but we did not see it actually completely calve. But I could bet that if you had come back in an hour, this arch would not have been there. And so it's an ever changing environment. What might be here at one moment could be gone the next. Constantly changing. So that was while we were around the continent in an, all the activities. We did that for six days out every morning, you know, after breakfast and then after lunch, um, we'd have two activities each day. And then we had to get back. So we had to get back across the Drake Passage, which was fun as well, because there were still lots to see and do. A call might go out. Here's folks on the bridge waiting to see. And here's folks outside. You can see the big cameras, a little bit colder out there. And these might be the kinds of things that you might see as we were making our way back across the Drake Passage back to Argentina. And another um, fabulous photo uh, in and around the continent, we saw several uh, ships like this, um, sw small vessels that could have been for research or could have just been 
um, small uh, excursion vessels. But again, you can't even see the tops of these mountains here. So I just want to wrap up a little bit here and thank you all for the opportunity to be here. I'm glad to share, to, to look at the chat now and see what questions, and I'll put a few, um, let's see here, put a few um, links into the chat. All right, let's see what we got here for some questions. So we've got... What have we got here? So Craig, um, okay, so yes, the answer was, uh, the winner was Amundsen. The Norwegian explorer was the first to reach the South Pole. So lots of great information. And thanks for Colin for putting some, um, some links in there. The penguins were really, really fun to see. I have to admit, penguins are fun. Um, what were the day and nighttime temperatures? So we were really fortunate that when we got in and around the continent, so even the day you saw the picture of me doing the mountaineering, um, many times we were didn't even have our gloves on when we were outside. So we had the first four days, we had really good, three days, we had really good weather and the temperatures were probably around 32 degrees. So it wasn't terribly cold. If you're moving around, you were, you were fine. And many times I was just using my, you know, gloveless hands to... Uh, deal with the um my cameras the nighttime temperature when we slept out on our camping night i would say it probably was in the 20s it was cold but not so cold that you your teeth were chattering and that you know you weren't going to be able to sleep so it was really um pretty good um similar to watching a david attenborough documentary i am i'm really Thank you. I'm uh, I'm impressed. I'll say, can anyone see any more questions here or just pop in and how many hours of daylight? So you did see when we were camping, we got onto the um, island that we were camping on or glacier, whatever it was, um, a little after nine. And it was probably 10, 15 or closer to 10. Yeah, probably 10, 15 or so when the sun actually set. So, um, and sun, sunrise, I think was around um, seven, 6.30, 7 a.m. So it was, um, you know, late in, in the, in the um, late summer heading into fall. Thank you for that. So uh, for, if there, we don't have any more questions in the chat, we're welcome to uh, raise your hand if you have a question as well for our today's speaker here, Marie. Uh, and let's make sure before we, before we run out of time here, give our big hands, give a big hand for, for Marie here for joining us today. Thank you, Marie, for Thank a you. presentation. My pleasure. I'm going to put a couple of links in here. Um, the first is to the uh, Shackleton book. I would. It's a short read. I would highly encourage um, reading that book because it really is pretty amazing. Um, and then also the story about the race to the South Pole. And then if you want to follow me on any of my adventures, there's my Instagram link. And if you're interested in well-being, I'm a well-being professional. There's my link for um, my LinkedIn profile. Thank you for that. Other Marie. questions? Anybody have yes. any other questions? Coming, How are we doing on you. time? Well, well, coming up for you. Are you doing okay on time to take a few more questions, Marie? I'm, I'm here. I'm fine. Right. Okay, yeah. very good. All right, we'll walk you through the process here. The first question is going to come from Colin Hussey. Uh, Colin, over to you. Yeah, have you seen uh, the documentary, the couple of documentaries, but have you seen the documentary uh, Antarctica, A Year on Ice? I saw that link that you put in there. I had not seen one, which was about the researchers. Um, like who a, lived following, there, yeah. Yeah. Who, who lived um, there for a while, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so it's really interesting. We only, so I showed you one picture of mm -hmm. what looked like, you know, the Argentinian camp. Um, we didn't, we were not in the area of, of the uh, continent where the big research stations are. Mm -hmm. So we did not see any big research stations. The only things we saw were like those little shack colonies. Um, but I read a very interesting book. I'll have to think of the name of this that was written by a woman who was a writer and who was spent a year on the continent um, as part of an arts um retreat and unlike the scientists who were there she was an artist a writer and a fascinating mm. story about her experience of living on the continent for a year and she actually went back several times later um I'll see if i can 
find the name of that book for you. But it's, um, yeah, I, if, any, if you have any interest to understanding that the most of the people who spend any time on the continent are those researchers and the work that they're doing, and especially given what's going on with climate change, as they can really see, um, you know, see what this is, uh, what, what's happening relative to climate change. It's a fascinating, a fascinating culture too that 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 grow that has grown out of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, the other link that I sent, um, the uh, endurance documentary, which is narrated mm -hmm. by Liam Neeson, also has a wonderful score by uh, Michael, the late Michael Small, a uh, British composer. And uh, so it's not like a temp track sounding score. It's really. Uh, really just well put together and they they interviewed actually some of Shackleton's uh descendants and the descendants of uh, of the peep the 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 brave crewmen who uh who uh, served with him on on that yeah. expedition that whole story is fascinating actually maybe uh, that is the documentary I have seen um mm -hmm. but yeah it, the whole story is just and the fact that they basically almost all live to tell the story is what's truly amazing about it Oh, we have a question from uh, Craig Stewart Adams here. Uh, Craig, I don't know if you want to uh, ask a question uh, out loud here. Is uh, regarding oh, sure. how well did you sleep? <laughs> yeah, how did you sleep <laughs> on the continent? <laughs> so it was. Um, I actually slept pretty well. Um, it was just not for very long. So by the time we finished um, digging our grave and getting everything set up, we. It was probably 11 o'clock by the time we got to sleep and they woke us up at um, a little before five because we needed to be back on the ship um, no later than 530. So it was a good night's sleep, just not a very long one. Great question. Thanks. We have another question from Alan Garber. Alan, would you like to ask your question in person? Uh, yeah, I'm curious, <clears throat> you know, what's the cost of an expedition like this? That's a good question. So. Um, depending on, of course, where you're flying from, you first have to get to where the ship is going to uh, depart from, which for us was in um, Ushuaia in Tierra del Fuego at the southern tip of Argentina. So I was coming from Boston and typically you're flying via Buenos Aires uh, to, to get to that <laughs> spot. There are also expeditions that depart from um, Puerto Arenas in Chile. So there's another place to depart from. You can, um, so airfare, uh, I think when I bought it was probably around $1,500. And then the cost of the expedition itself, uh, we did go through a tour operator. So that made it probably a little bit more expensive. Um, but if you directly book with the ship, um, the, you know, the company, we were in a double room. There are many different kinds of options. So it's kind of the, depending how much you wanna spend, um, if you wanted to be in a quad cabin, which we originally were booked in and we're really glad that we upgraded. So with our upgrade, it probably cost us about $10,000 for the ship experience, but they have very many different cabin options. You could spend probably um, up to you know $20,000 um, per person, depending on the cruise line that you were traveling with. This group, again, is ocean-wide expeditions out of the, the Netherlands. What I loved about them is they are Arctic specialists. The only two places on the planet they travel to are, are, are Antarctica and the Arctic. So their ships are purposely um, built for Arctic expeditions. Our next three questions are from Janice, Bill Buchanan, and Craig Stewart-Adams. Janice, over to you. Very fascinating, Mari. Did you uh, spend any time in Argentina? We did, actually. We had three days in Buenos Aires on the way to um, Ushuaia. And uh, again, it was summertime, so it was a lovely time to be in Buenos Aires. Fabulous city. I am not a Spanish language speaker. It's the kind of city that you can easily navigate. Fabulous restaurants, food, lovely parks, great art. Um, so Buenos Aires was was lovely. And then in Ushuaia, when we returned, we had uh, two days just to explore the end of the world. Um, as it's known, the Pan American Highway ends in Ushuaia. That's the road that starts in Alaska and goes all the way to the tip of uh, the continent down there. Uh, so we hiked a little bit and had a lovely hike to a glacial lake 
um, in the time we were in and around uh, Tierra del Fuego. So that was also a fabulous, fabulous place. Bill Buchanan, next question for Bill Buchanan. Uh, good morning, Mari. Uh, great presentation to uh, a place that to, 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 to me seems like, you know, another world, another planet. But anyway, I've, I have read about Shackleton, you know, being sort of an adventure, out country, back country adventure myself. And uh, it's a remarkable story, as you know. Um, and I just wondered, is there any remnant of the endurance left, really? The ship? Can they find anything? Yes, it actually was just, um, see if I can find a link for that. T two years ago, was it, that they found some remnants of the the vessel? Um, I'd have to Google it to see. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't have a link handy for that, but um, just do some Googling on that because I think um, it was just a couple of years ago, there was um, an expedition to find that. The whole story of, of I, I'd highly recommend reading the Endurance book. Um, it's just such a fascinating story to think what they went through and now, and, and now having been there, it's like, how did they survive? It's just amazing, amazing story. And the journals that they all kept was how they, you know, how they've documented uh, their survival. It was, it was really fascinating. So I would strongly encourage if this is an interest area for you, go for it because there's a lot of good information out there. We got, we got course, Craig, uh, Craig, but, oops, sorry, sorry, Bill. He, he's held up by the business community as an example uh, of leadership, you know during the most adverse situation. The only downside for me in reading that book was that when they had to eat their dogs, being a dog of this Yeah, year. I know, me too. Uh, one, one last question for you, Mari. Uh, since this is a neutral continent, mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you have to, if you want to go down there as an individual uh, a traveler, do you have to chuck through a central gateway that allows you to go to Antarctica? So you can't get there by yourself like you can't just yeah. take your boat and yeah so there is a, um and one of the things that they do which is really interesting is this is we only saw a couple of other ships and some were much bigger ships um cruise lines um they they basically kind of control who has access and where i don't know where that control body lives and resides but there is someone who um is you know who controls that and part of it is that there are restrictions on how many people can be on the continent at any given moment um so when we were cruising if we had 172 people we couldn't have more than i think the number is 100 people from our group on the continent at any given moment which is why we were off doing other things cruising and not just landing um so yes yeah, it's, it's kind of fascinating but no you can't just kind of take your boat and go it has to be um it is a regulated um the, the use of the island and the the continent and the visiting of the continent is regulated great presentation thank you very much for joining us this morning hey, we, the next question is from uh craig stewart adams then mike milstein and then i think a comment perhaps from nick Bowles. i'm, I'm curious were you uh, how were the southern skies at night were you able to see the the stars no, and I carried a tripod with me in hopes that I would. Um, they were cloudy. We had mostly cloudy nights. There was one night we had a barbecue. I didn't include the photo from the barbecue, but we had amazing. This cruise line was just amazing in terms of their hospitality. So there was a barbecue one night. The temperatures were fairly warm. We're all sitting out on deck when you know this big catered barbecue. Um, and that was the only night where there were clear skies um, in the whole time we were there. There were some clear skies when we were crossing the Drake Passage, but it was so rough at that point, you know, it, you weren't going to be able to take any photographs. And so we did not experience any um, aurora borealis or any um, type of experience like that. Unfortunately, still on my bucket list. And then we have a question from Mike Melstein. Yeah, I actually have a question uh, for Nick Bowles. I, I'm curious to see how this uh, compared to your experience on your trip. And Nick uh, posts some of his uh, trips on YouTube. So I'm sure uh, if you wanted to look that up, you'd uh, find out about his experience. 
Are you still with us, Nick? Uh, yes, I am. And thank you, Murray. This has been just wonderful. You had a, a, a great experience. I did. And uh, it reminded me very much of, of, of my trip down there. Uh, Ernest Shackleton is a fascinating story. And he is buried at South Georgia Island, right. which is another place that uh, expedition ships sometimes go, which is an absolutely fascinating spot. And part of the tradition is that they take people to his grave, get out the whiskey, and you do a toast to Ernie. So if you want to visit a good Ernie Irish Shackleton, toast, South Georgia Island is the spot. Yeah, um, there are a number of uh, cruise lines that do a tour that includes the Falklands, which only has about 3,500 people who are residents there, natives there, um, residents. Um, and they do visit South Georgia, which is it's um, the way the peninsula is. It's on the far tip of, of the peninsula. So that um, if you're really interested to the history aspects of this, um, I've known some people who've done those kinds of uh, adventures as well. That was thank, the trip you, we Nick. made, but uh, it is longer, quite a bit longer, and therefore more expensive. So. Yeah. But fascinating. Thank you, Nick. And if you wouldn't mind putting your YouTube channel link into the, the chat so we can uh, save that, I would love to see that too. Thank you. Sure. And I think, uh, uh, Janet, uh, Susan, did you want to make a comment uh, here? You put a comment in the chat. Do you want to make it out loud here for for, for oh, Mary? Do I? Okay. What I wanted to say to you is this was fascinating. I love the penguin porpoising. I never yeah. heard that expression before. I grew up in semi-Arctic Chicago. <laughs> so viewing your amazing adventure from my comfy home is as close as I want to get. But I want to <laughs> thank you for taking me there. Now you're, I don't have to go. You're welcome. Um, it's not for everyone. Um, you do need to be, you know, in good physical condition to be able to do some of the activities, you know, such as the kayaking and the mountaineering. Um, and if you don't like cold or if you do not, you know, uh, fare well on a, a bumpy ship ride, then I talked to somebody recently who said I could never do it because they just cannot do that unevenness. Um, you know, we, you literally, there's, there's bars on every, on each side of the, the walkways in the halls um, throughout the ship. And you literally walk from one side to the next in the way that the ship was rolling. So if that's not for you, um, consider a hike someplace. <laughs> no, it, it's the snow. If you had to dig out of a couple blizzards, yeah, I'm, you don't love snow. I grew, up in New, I grew up in New England, believe me, you know, yeah. I've been I've been through winters with 15 feet of snow. I know what it's like. I, so yeah, I think that digging your own grave. I, I my mother used to say that to me, but she didn't mean <laughs> the same thing. Anyway, yeah. thank you. This is You're wonderful. Welcome. Thank you for that. Uh, and welcome. I think uh, uh, Janice, I think you might have had one more comment, perhaps. Uh, yeah. For, so for one thing I loved about this trip, even though it's a little weird, is that um, it took you three years, I think, from the date you were supposed to originally take off, which made you uh, anticipate the thrill that much longer. And I think it, it, it raises the excitement level. What do you have planned next? And uh, how far in advance are you going to salivate on it? <laughs> um, well, the in most immediate um, adventure that's coming up next is a bike and barge um, experience in northern Italy. So starting in Venice and biking towards Milan, although we don't get quite as far as Milan. And just um, as part of that trip, I'm going to do a speed tour of Slovenia. For those of you that, that oh. don't know, uh, Slovenia is um, two hours by car from Venice. It's the size of Massachusetts. I'm going to spend three days and four days and three nights uh, just driving around looking at yeah. mountains and lakes and castles and, you know, seeing another another country. It's right at the top of the Adriatic, just to the east of um of Italy. Um, and then the next big adventure will be continent number seven which will be Oceania, uh, will start actually in with New, New Zealand uh, because it's gonna take enough time and there's some particular things uh, we, my friend, my traveling companion and I wanna see um, in New Zealand. So we'll probably do that next year. So I'll get continent number seven bagged next year. 
Have you been to the North Pole? I've been north of the Arctic Circle in Norway. Oh, okay. Phenomenal presentation. I'm sorry, didn't ask, Thank but I just you. wanted to just tell you one of the most extraordinary reviews, the, the context in which you put everything. There is not, no one of us here who watched this <laughs> would not be uh, uh, aware more than they were an hour ago of what it takes to go on one of these trips, what it mm -hmm. takes to do it right. And you were just phenomenal. Thank you Thank so you. Very much. Thank you. Well, this was really fun to put together because it gave me kind of the opportunity to sit back and look at what that experience was and to see how I might explain it to someone who'd never been. So I appreciate the opportunity to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, once again, for an incredible presentation. We're going to throw it over to President Tony here before just a reminder, June 7th here, uh, we have uh, uh, Iris Jamal D Dunkel. We on June 14th, we have Maggie Buckley here. Thank you, Maggie, for joining us today. On June 21st, we have Ryan Levanway here. You're going to have all of our MLB fans here come join us for on the 21st. And on June 28th, uh, we have our social event at the Marines Memorial Hotel in San Francisco. So there'll be no Zoom on the 28th. Please make sure if you're going to join us for the Wednesday event on the 28th here, let us know as soon as possible here so we can make sure that there's room for everybody uh, as well. And we'll put more information mm -hmm. in the bulletin as well. Please read uh, Pete's article specifically in the bulletin here for more information on that and thank you alan for all your hard work setting those events up alan any comments you want to make with regards to the live event here?